With this week's edition, we now celebrate our 22nd and a half year of service to the amateur radio community around the world. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1170 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The International Space Station is destabilized when the engines fire on a newly installed Russian module by accident. We will have all the details. The Federal Communications Commission looks to reestablish the Technological Advisory Council and is actively soliciting new membership applications. New York Mars HFNet participants aid in response to a fatal maritime disaster. We will have the story. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is now offering a review of the platform for the upcoming Virtual Ham Fest. Switzerland imposes new import restrictions on electronics, including amateur radio equipment. A new 8-meter experimental station is on the air from the southern United States. NASA has developed a specialized antenna specifically to survive in harsh climates. And a special event station is on the air that you don't want to miss. You can work W8T from the world's largest teapot. We will have all of this and a lot more as we celebrate 22 and a half years of service on this week's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about geek nomenclature and will introduce you to the concept of prosody and what it has to do with artificial intelligence. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, how are contests scored? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a nostalgic trip back to Rochester, New York's own Olson Electronics. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will answer some questions he has received in a segment he calls Greg's Short Topic List. That's all straight ahead as we celebrate 22 and a half years of service right here on North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio. And we take to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in a very nondescript looking building where it's kind of sunny and nice out today, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from along the southern shore of Lake Ontario in our news bureau in Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our mountaintop radio station here in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the rain and the humidity and the heat have finally left, and we're expecting three or four days of beautiful crisp fall weather, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox to Fox. And reporting from a sunny but humidity-free Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we're playing the weather whiplash game, hotter one week, cooler the next, wow. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week is this late-breaking story. BBC News reported the International Space Station was destabilized after engines of a newly arrived Russian module inadvertently fired up, officials say. With more details on the mishap on board the station, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting Southgate Amateur Radio News. U.S. space agency NASA said that mission control teams corrected the action and all systems are operating normally. This was done by activating thrusters on another module of the ISS. An investigation is now underway. U.S. and Russian officials said that the seven crew members aboard the space station were never in any danger. The malfunction happened several hours after the Russian Nauka module docked with the ISS on Thursday following an eight-day flight. 
NASA tweeted that the module's thrusters started firing at 1645 GMT inadvertently and unexpectedly, moving the station 45 degrees out of attitude. It added that the recovery operations regained attitude and that the station was back in attitude control and in good shape. Communications with the ISS crew were lost for several minutes during the incident. However, they really didn't feel any movement as the space station pitched at half a degree a second. The mishap forced NASA and Boeing to push back an uncrewed test flight of Boeing's Starliner spacecraft to the ISS due on the 30th of July until at least the 3rd of August. The 13-metre-long 20-ton NALCA module was earlier attached to the rear of the orbiting platform, linking up with the other major Russian segments on the station. The module should have launched in 2007, but the vessel suffered repeated slips in schedule, in part because of budget difficulties, but also because engineers encountered a raft of technical problems during development. Even after it launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan a week ago, it experienced propulsion issues that required workarounds from controllers in Moscow. In the end, however, it docked with the station on the planned date. The new module will result in a significant boost in habitable volume for the ISS, raising it by 70 cubic metres. Cosmonauts will use the extra space to conduct experiments and to store cargo. They'll also use it as a rest area and it has another toilet for the crew to use on the station. You can read the full story at bbc.co.uk forward slash news. In addition, the module carries with it a large robotic arm, ERA, supplied by the European Space Agency, ESA. This 11-meter-long device will be able to operate all around the Russian end of the ISS. With the aid of an elbow joint, it will shift position by moving hand over hand. Naoka's installation comes just as Russia has been questioning its future role in the ISS project. Moscow officials recently warned about the more than 20-year age of some of their on-orbit hardware and intimated the country could pull out of the station in 2025. And Russia has shown little interest in joining the U.S.-led lunar platform known as the Gateway, which will be assembled later this decade. The Federal Communications Commission is seeking nominations for a chairperson and members of the Technological Advisory Council. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, is here with more. In a July 21st public notice, the Commission announced that it intends to re-establish the TAC for two years by August 20th. It's anticipated that the renewed panel could hold its first meeting in October. The TAC provides technical advice to the FCC and makes recommendations on issues and questions presented to it. The panel typically has several radio amateurs among its members. Greg Lappin, N9GL, has represented ARRL on the TAC. Among other issues, FCC Acting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel will ask the TAC to start looking beyond 5G and to conceptualize 6G. All organizational or individual members appointed to the Council or its working groups are subject to an ethics review. Council members receive no compensation for their service. In other words, it's a volunteer position. Nominations for membership must be submitted to the FCC by by August 20th. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. In addition, Rosenworcel will ask the TAC to study advanced spectrum sharing techniques, implementation of artificial intelligence, and machine learning to improve the utilization and administration of a spectrum and other emerging technologies. Procedures for submitting nominations are spelled out in the public notice, which includes details on membership qualifications and obligations. The FCC said it's particularly interested in receiving nominations and expressions of interest from individuals and organizations in these sectors. Communications service providers and organizations representing communications service providers manufacturers of communications equipment and organizations representing manufacturers of communications equipment, providers of internet applications or cloud-based services, scientists and engineers from academia or independent consultants who are recognized experts in their field, qualified representatives of other stakeholders and interested parties with relevant expertise, 
Members will be selected to balance the expertise and viewpoints that are necessary to effectively address the issues to be considered by the Council, the FCC said. On July 6th, an evening Army Military Auxiliary Radio System HF practice net in Federal Emergency Management Agency Region 2, which is New York and New Jersey, was interrupted by several Mayday distress calls on the channel, which is shared with the Maritime Service. With more details on this Maritime distress call, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files the special report from League Headquarters. Net Control Station Ron Tomo, KE2UK, immediately halted the training and attempted without success to establish communication with the station. Tomo then directed two other net members who heard the distress call, John Hoover, K2XU, and Wayne Gearing, K2WG, to attempt to establish communication and offer assistance. While the other net members were attempting to contact the vessel by radio, Toma contacted the U.S. Coast Guard station at Jones Beach Island in New York, which alerted the Coast Guard Sector Command at Long Island Sound to join the Mars operators on frequency. Mars operators remained on frequency to assist the Coast Guard in listening for any distress calls. Several hours later, the fishing vessel Falling Star was identified as missing with 15 individuals on board, all from Honduras. Ten days later, the Coast Guard confirmed that 10 of the passengers survived in a skiff and were rescued by a passing commercial oil tanker. The falling star was en route to Guatemala when it was reported to have rolled over without warning on July 6th. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The commercial oil tanker, the MTM Amsterdam, which spotted their small craft, took the survivors and their skiff on board. Tragically, the skipper of the Falling Star died one day before the survivors were found and was buried at sea. Mars volunteers alerted the U.S. Coast Guard to the vessel in distress several hours before the Falling Star was identified and confirmed as missing. While ten of those aboard Falling Star were rescued, five others didn't make it home after this tragic event. The Jamaica Defense Force Coast Guard collaborated with counterparts from the U.S., Honduras, Nicaragua, Colombia, Cuba, and the Cayman Islands in their search for the vessel. The next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo on August 14th and 15th is offering a platform preview of the show. From 1500 UTC on August 1st through 2400 UTC on August 3rd, 2021, Anyone can preview the Expo platform at no charge. The fully functioning preview will allow prospective participants to gain comfort with the platform layout and its navigation, including the virtual lobby, auditorium, exhibit hall, and meeting lounges. In addition, five speaker presentations from the last Expo will be available, as well as a small exhibit area featuring fully functional booths from Flex Radio and QSO Today. Early bird tickets for the third QSO Today Expo are $10 until August 8th and $12.50 after. Register at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo website. ARRL is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. When operating from a remote location, such as an outdoor camping trip, in many parts of the world there is no cell phone service away from towns and cities. To make matters worse, in these areas there is almost never a VHF UHF ham radio repeater in range when wide area coverage is needed. So apart from strictly local communications using VHF and UHF simplex radio, how do we send messages to friends and family over great distances? And how do we call for help? A similar problem can even arise in an urban environment if a major disaster strikes, like the breakdown of the power grid. One solution is to use a satellite phone, but this technology is very expensive, requires subscriptions, and there is no guarantee that the complex infrastructure of satellite communications will work under all circumstances. 
The obvious solution for ham radio operators would be to switch to shortwave communication using battery-operated radios and NVIS modes of operation. NVIS stands for Near Vertical Incidence Skywave, which means transmitting with special antennas radiating directly upwards to communicate with other stations 30 to 300 kilometers away with low power, which would be the most useful communications distance if help was needed. One could use single sideband voice communications, but this requires that the person we want to reach is sitting constantly at his or her radio to be able to receive the message. This can be a problem. In a real emergency, there probably won't be time for this. We could instead use capable digital modes with automatic messaging handling capabilities like JS8 Call, but these require notebook computers or other complicated setups in the field which consume a lot of energy and can be difficult to recharge off-grid on a reliable basis. Evgeny Uniform Alpha 3 Alpha Hotel Mike and Sergei Uniform Alpha 9 Oscar Victor have developed another mode of digital shortwave communications which aims to be easy to use, capable and, most importantly, friendly to the operator's resources in the field. Apart from a low-power battery-operated transceiver and a small digital interface, only an Android smartphone is needed, which can be recharged with cheap and readily available consumer-grade solar chargers. Evgeny and Sergei have created an app called HF Pager, which allows the use of a smartphone's sound chip to encode and decode audio signals in the single sideband audio passband of the transceiver, similar to PC-based modes like FT8 and JS8 Call. It uses various rates of data transmission, 1.46, 5.86, 23.44 and 46.88 board. The modulation type is 18-tone incremental frequency shift keying, IFSK, with forward error correction to the Reed solomon code and a superblock of four RS blocks with interleaving. You can find out more about the new HF Pager data mode for operating in remote locations by visiting qrper.com. That's qrper.com. And our thanks go to Stephen, G7 Victor Foxtrot Yankee, for spotting this item. Purchasing certain amateur radio equipment and other electronics in Switzerland just got a little more complicated. Companies in countries outside the European Union are no longer being permitted to import electronics to customers in Switzerland, unless those companies have a business affiliation with Switzerland, according to a posting on the website of the USKA Switzerland's National Amateur Radio Society. A translation of the USKA posting says that the use of a Swiss-based intermediary for companies in those nations became mandatory as of mid-July. Although Switzerland is not part of the European Union, a trade agreement exists between the European Union and the Swiss government. The USKA's head of political lobbying, Willy Wallenweider, HB9 AMC, wrote on the website that the organization considers this action of strategic importance to radio amateurs. Willie noted that the USKA hopes to petition the government during the consultation period on behalf of Swiss radio amateurs. Avcom, the UK's communications regulator, has plans to mandate low Earth orbit satellite broadband systems such as OneWeb and SpaceX's Starlink to engage in frequency coordination in order to avoid blocking one another's signals. Ofcom has said it will amend the company's satellite licenses to ensure such coordination happens. They are particularly concerned about interference posing an obstacle when the market opens to additional satellite network companies. The regulator said satellites in non-geostationary orbits have a greater risk of interference with their uplink and downlink transmissions because as they move across the sky, competing satellites can end up in the same antenna direction at the same time, compromising communication with user terminals on Earth. The website, ArsTechnica.com, revealed the development, noting that Ofcom has issued a more detailed report outlining its concerns. Ofcom identified such constellations as SpaceX, already in beta service, and the proposed Kuiper constellation from Amazon. Ofcom's report also identifies OneWeb, owned by Barty Global and the UK government, which is in its initial phase. If you've ever dreamed of the perfect antenna, well, it doesn't yet exist. But scientists at NASA have developed one they believe is robust enough for one of Jupiter's moons. You can think of it as a kind of super antenna. The unprecedented design from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory is an all-metal structure created to withstand the intensely radioactive environment of Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Its designer, Nasir Shahat, 
A senior antenna engineer at NASA created it even before an actual robotic lander for Europa becomes a reality. He said it was important to be ready for effective communications from such a harsh, watery, radioactive environment as Europa. Writing on the IEEE Spectrum website, Nasir said the antenna is able to transmit at a high data rate, is lightweight enough to not impede takeoff and landing, can communicate with Earth from 550 million miles away, and is resistant to the intense ionizing radiation of Jupiter. He said a critical point was the antenna's construction of circularly polarized union cells that are entirely aluminum. They are capable of transmitting and receiving on X-band frequencies of 7.145 to 7.19 GHz for the uplink and 8.4 to 8.45 GHz for the downlink. Nasir said although it was designed for Europa, it is a revolutionary enough design that we're already successfully implementing it in future missions for other destinations in the solar system. He said that meanwhile, the lab might make use of this design in 2026 on a joint JPL and European Space Agency mission to bring rocks back from Mars. Nasir wrote that when a Europa lander mission becomes a reality, the antenna will further prove its real worth. He said without a working antenna, the lander will never be able to tell us whether we could have living neighbors on Europa. This week, we introduce a new segment called Throwback, where we go back in time to our previous edition of the program, to see what was happening in the world of amateur radio. This week, we flash back to August 8th of 2009, where we covered a story about local amateurs helping to solve an interference problem to local public safety communications. From edition number 850, here with the story is then anchor Steve Batten, W4XQ. When you live on a remote island with numerous mountains and valleys, communications can be tricky. Add interference that blocks the main communications frequency used by the local emergency rescue squad, and you've got a disaster waiting to happen. That's what responders and residents on St. John and the U.S. Virgin Islands recently found themselves facing. On June 12th, the primary repeater output frequency for St. John Rescue was completely blocked by a two-tone AFSK signal that continued for more than a week. Because St. John Rescue uses the frequency to dispatch, monitor, and provide two-way communications during emergency calls, it was vital that the cause of the problem be located and corrected. According to Phyllis Benton, NP2MZ, a public information officer in the ARRL U.S. Virgin Islands section, some members of St. John Rescue are also members of ARES. With some additional help from the FCC, three hams, Paul Jordan, NP2JF, Mal Preston, NP2L, and George Klein, KP2G, set out to find the source of the interference. The interference was not directly affecting operation of a second rescue repeater, Benton told the ARRL. St. John Rescue Chief Gilly Grimes and Paul Jordan, NP2JF, used handheld Yagi antennas to fox hunt for the source of the interference, she said. To their surprise, the signal was being received off the back of the antennas and coming in very strong. The source of the interference turned out to be 32 miles away from a tower on Mount St. George's on the island of St. Croix. The carrier frequency was just 7.5 kilohertz above the rescue frequency of 158.7525 megahertz, she explained. Upon closer inspection, the problem was isolated to a repeater that is part of the new U.S. Virgin Islands territory-wide MPT-1327 trunking system. This transmitter was licensed for and was putting out 120 watts with a passband of 50 kilohertz and was being tested as the control channel. Benton said that the second unaffected repeater operates at an output frequency of 159.66 megahertz, far enough away from the trunking frequency being tested to avoid being affected. This second repeater serves areas not covered by the primary repeater, so until the problem was resolved, a large part of St. John was left without reliable emergency rescue radio communications. 
Once the source of the problem was identified, the interference was turned off on June 19th. To head off any future interference problems, the trunking system promoters have asked St. John Rescue to change its current repeater frequencies to frequencies that theoretically would not receive interference from the trunking system. Benton said that St. John Rescue is considering the request. Reporting from our Southern News Bureau in Virginia Beach, Virginia, I'm Steve Batten, W4XQ. The Brazilian Amateur Radio Society, Labre, met again with their regulator, Anatel, on July the 2nd, 2021, to discuss issues related to online amateur radio exams. Labre presented an online survey to demonstrate the demand for tests at the national level, organized by state and by intended class. The regulator will, based on these numbers, carry out actions to try to reduce the backlog of radio amateurs waiting to take exams. Labre suggested that a registry be created to facilitate access by interested parties and better organize the supply and demand for vacancies. Each person would sign up to this registry and Anatel would direct vacant exam spaces offered to those registered. At the moment, there's no accessible way of consulting or registering to fill these vacancies and interested parties must make numerous attempts by accessing the existing application system and manually searching for an exam slot state by state. Anatel, the regulator, has accepted Labre's suggestions and will carry out internal consultations for the possible creation of this registry, possibly as early as August, within its operational conditions. Labre offered to provide any assistance in this regard, since, as a result of their survey, they've been contacted by hundreds of people interested in taking the exams. Labre again presented to Anatel the problem of the very slow process in obtaining a station license once the exam was passed. This has proved to be the main problem for candidates, especially for the entry of new radio amateurs into the hobby. A new meeting to continue discussions on the topic is scheduled to take place in the coming weeks. Labre will continue to cooperate with Anatel to facilitate access to amateur radio and thus promote its growth throughout Brazil, as it has done throughout its 87 years of existence. You can read more at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Brazil. Swiss radio amateurs are facing a fee to use the QO100 satellite. In what might be a first, Switzerland's telecommunications regulator Ofcom is charging the equivalent of $76.25 to issue special permits to radio amateurs to use the QO100 amateur satellite transponders. According to a post on the website for the USKA, Switzerland's IARU member society, the regulator wishes to protect license-exempt users in the 2.4 GHz industrial, scientific, and medical band, and Ofcom reserves the right to withdraw the special permit if problems arise. The special permit entitles the holder to use a transmitter with a maximum output of 100 watts PEP for a satellite uplink in the 2400 to 2410 MHz band. As part of their application, radio amateurs must provide coordinates, antenna gain in DBI, antenna height above ground, antenna direction, and a telephone number where the radio amateur can be reached while operating, in addition to the usual name and call sign information. Reports suggest that jamming stations have been deployed on the lower portion of 40 meters. The jamming appears to be coming from Cuba. The signals, spaced at regular intervals, exhibit a squishy, popping noise. The apparent jamming showed up after anti-government protesters took to the streets in Cuba, followed by a government crackdown. So far, there's no proven connection between the jamming and the protests, as evidence has been circumstantial. DX spots suggest that Cuban hams are on the air on SSB, but do appear rare on 40 meters. A lot of Cuban spots point to FT8 activity. The jamming issue has drawn the attention of the FCC, which is looking into the matter, according to the tech publication Motherboard. Too many people around the world are fighting uphill battles to be able to use technology to expand economic opportunity, express themselves, and organize without fear of reprisal, an FCC spokesperson told Motherboard. 
The FCC is committed to supporting the free flow of information and ensuring that the Internet remains open for everyone. We are assessing these reports in conjunction with our field agents and communicating with the Department of State as this issue develops. Outside of ham radio, the ability to connect with some social media sites and even with the Internet inside Cuba has been reportedly tricky. Connecting to the Federación de Radioaficionados de Cuba website, Cuba's IARU member society from outside of Cuba has been unreliable. This week, users attempting to do so, at least those in the U.S., got a shrugging cartoon character and the legend, Acceso Denegado, Access Denied. The FRC Facebook page is accessible, but links to the FRC website are blocked. FRC had warned of possible outages a week ago, attributing the problem to maintenance being done in the data center where FRC is located. Well-known amateur radio contester and DXer Fred Laun, K3ZO, pointed out in a July 17th post to the Potomac Valley Radio Club Reflector that typical ham radio contacts with Cuba are not normally about politics, though I suppose in the wake of recent events they may have become so. Josh Nass, KI6NAZ, of the YouTube channel Ham Radio Crash Course, is calling the interference the Cuban rum runner an oblique reference to the Russian woodpecker of yesteryear. And Matthew Kaskavich, K0LWC, recorded an emergency broadcast message on his YouTube channel to advise viewers of the purported jamming. International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 President Ramon Santoyo, XE1KK, said no complaints had been received by July 20th. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. This is the show about technology in which me, one Leo Laporte, will attempt to speak English. <clears throat> Not a native tongue for uh, technologists generally. We like, uh, we like our acronyms. We like our geek speak. But I will attempt and often fail, but I will attempt to speak plain English as we speak about technology so that uh, one and all can understand. You know what the ampersand is? All right. Immediately, Leo goes into some weird techno speak. No, it's, um, it's a character. It's on your keyboard right above the seven. It's that funny squiggly character that means and. It's shorthand for and. Ampersand. Do people even, I guess they use it. You use it like uh, if you're a law firm. Dewey, Cheatham, ampersand, how? That kind of thing. Well, for want of an ampersand, <laughs> uh, Google bricked a bunch of Chromebooks. Whoops. <laughs> uh, it has fixed a major Chrome OS bug that locked users out of their devices. They pushed an update, Chrome OS version 91.0.4472.165. There's another thing geeks like, dots, for some reason. We call them dots. You might know them as periods, the end of a sentence, you know. We call them dots because we got to call everything something different, right? We don't call uh, exclamation marks exclamation marks. That's exclamation mark. There's too many syllables. It's five. We call them bangs. Hello, bang. <laughs> That's what we call them, just so you know. If I all of a sudden lapse into geek speak, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say dots and bangs. There is no, oddly enough, there is no shorthand for ampersand. There should be, because that's a lot of syllables too, but ampersand, ampersand, three, I guess we can, three might be the number, the top that we can take. Any more than three, we, we got we to gotta make up something. Got to give it an acronym or a shorthand or something. Anyway, it's why ampersands like percent signs can cause problems. Apple had a problem with percent signs. They just fixed. If you used percent signs in your Wi-Fi router name, you know, we call it, more geek speak, SSID, the SSID. I might lapse into geek speak and say, hey, you know, you can change your SSID. It's the name of your wireless network. It stands for service set identifier. Okay, fine. Who cares? The name of your network. If you change the name of your Wi-Fi network to something with a percent sign in it, not just any old percent, you got to do a certain thing, but... Anybody who, with an iPhone, until 
like a minute ago, anybody with an iPhone walked by it, the iPhone would suddenly crash and be useless. Like, you, like really, like you couldn't just turn it off and on again. You had to do a whole big thing connected to a computer and fix it. Yeah, because of a little percent sign, right? I mean, if you want to know the backstory, I don't suppose anybody does. But it turns out in, in some programming languages, the percent sign is used as a special letter that's used in a special way for print formatting. And Apple forgot that. And forgot to, uh, we, we call it escape it. They forgot to turn it into something harmless. And instead it was ha extremely harmful. Extremely harmful. Well, I guess bricking Chromebooks is extremely harmful too. Google never told us, but uh, Android police and uh, a Reddit user named Elitist Ferret. That's another thing geeks do. Weird handles. That's his handle. Elitist Ferret. Ferreted it out. And it was a typo. One ampersand left out, and that caused who knows how many, thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of users to suddenly get locked out of their Chromebook. I know somebody who did get locked out. The only fix was to power wash it, to like start over again. Google has put out a new build instead of 91.0, not 4.4. Oh, that's another thing geeks do. Sometimes we say, oh, instead of zero. But the real geeks will say, I'm Leo. That's a zero, not an O. Oh, sorry. 91.0.4472.165 has been replaced by 91.0.4472.167. Note the difference. It's two beta. And that's rolling out. Might take a few days. If you had a Chromebook you couldn't get into, don't blame yourself. It's And it will update without your logging in. So that's good. So if you don't want to power wash the device, which means erase the whole thing and start over, just wait. They'll they'll push out something. They'll fix it and it'll be fine. Why would a missing ampersand cause this? Well, it has to do with a C programming language. I'm sorry. Or in this case, C++, which is C to better. C++, if you want to do the and operator, this and that, you need two ampersands, two. But somehow somebody forgot the second one and it broke the program. And because of the error, Chrome OS never checked user passwords against the stored key on the device. And so no password, even the right one would come back, would let, let you in. In every case, it would be, sorry, you can't be verified just because of the missing little and there. That's all, little ampersand missing. You might wonder how this got through three stages of testing and, you know, code review and all the things. Well, that's, you know, that's another thing we geeks do. Eh, these things happen. If you use, if you use computers, you just kind of go, you know, we're beaten down. Oh, well, yeah, just another, just another day in computer land. The word of the week this week. You ready for the word of the week? Prosody. Prosody, P-R-O-S-O-D-Y. It, uh, it comes from, you know, um, the original use of prosody was uh, the pattern and rhythm of sound in poems. But nowadays in linguistics, it's concerned with how speech sounds, not with the letters, the consonants, the, uh, the vowels, the, the actual phonetics of it, but... What makes each speaker unique, the intonation, the rhythm, those things also known as the suprasegmentals. <laughs> but I think prosodies, as hard as it is to <laughs> pronounce, is even easier than suprasegmentals. But from it, you can, you know, you listen, you hear somebody, you know if they're happy, they're sad, you know, they're, they're excited, if they're being sarcastic, that kind of thing. Prosody. reason I mention it is it's the latest, it's the hottest thing now in computer science because we're trying to, that was, that was, that was my, I didn't say anything. Did I say, did I, oh, I said the C word. You know what? Computer, change your wake word. Okay, you can choose from Amazon. Which of these do you like? None of them. So there is a new wake word for the Amazon Echo, but they're even better. There's a new voice. Let me try it again. Computer, change your voice. Let's see if we can get the new voice. Okay, you're all set. I'll be the voice you hear when you speak to this device. Do you hear that? If you'd like to change how you wake me up, 
You can also change your wake word. Do you hear that? It's a it's a new male voice. Actually, Amazon is a little behind and all. I don't know that. But Amazon is not as fancy, schmancy, as Google and uh, Microsoft and Apple. They're getting really good at prosody. What is so? This is why prosody is an important word because you take what is a you know computer generated voice. It's a little robotic. Says everything properly, but I'm not quite sure how to help you with that. Okay, now you can shut up. <laughs> I pressed the button. <laughs> it just the shut up button is really handy on those things. So uh, I said that I said the c word. I said computer, and it it wakes up because I said I made it. it. That was a mistake, by the way. You should never make your Amazon Echo wake word be computer. Ziggy's good. I don't think I'm going to say Ziggy much in real life, but computer I say half the time. So. That's not a good wake word, at least for me. Prosody, back to prosody. So we take a synthesized voice, which because our brains are so finely tuned, such finely tuned instruments to the real world, this for environmental reasons, for survival, I guess you should say, reasons. Because if, you know, you can't tell that that uh, person is about to schnocker you, <laughs> you can't tell that they're angry it's uh, challenging, to say the least. You know, it's a survival problem. So we're, we're very finely tuned to our environment for a number of reasons. You know, mostly survival, but in a number of ways, I guess I should say. But voice is one of them. And so we can tell pretty easily that that's not a real voice. So what's happening? Oh, interesting. Companies are working hard to create machine voices that sound human using prosody. So they take the robotic voice, the voice that's, it's not, it's not even robotic. It might be perfectly formed. You can kind of tell that that Amazon Echo voice was, was not real, right? It was too, it was too perfect, right? So they take these robotic voices and they apply human prosody. They actually record real people. Google first did this. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, you could have Issa Rae, comedian, or John Legend, the singer, be your Google voice. And the way they did it, they brought Issa and John into the studio and had them record a bunch of sentences. Not not every sentence in the world. Just a, you know, I don't know, an hour worth of sentences. And they took the prosody, the inflection, the intonation, the, the syllable stress, all of that stuff, and made it into better voices. And uh, it sounded like John Legend was waking you up in the morning. It was still a little weird. Apple's doing the same thing. Apple has now some new voices. If you're on an iPhone... You can go to the American Voices. And, you know, there's the traditional Siri voice. I don't know if we're going to hear this. Let me let me see. I'll have to turn it up a little bit. The traditional uh, Siri voice, which you know how she sounds. Hi, I'm Siri. Actually, Here's the voice you'd like me to use. That's a guy, isn't it? That's voice one. Here's voice two. Hi, I'm Siri. Choose the voice you'd like me to use. Now, that's the same machine-generated text... At applying prosody, she sounds kind of perky. Here's another one. Hi, I'm Siri. Choose the voice you'd like me to use. He, I scared my daughter because I was doing something and uh, that voice came up and she said, who's that? I said, well, that's voice three. Sounds like somebody I know. It does, doesn't it? Here's voice four. Hi, I'm Siri. Choose the voice you'd like me to use. That's, the, I guess that's, is that the more traditional one? I don't know. I'm in the variety of voices. Oh, you get variety is American, Australian. Hi, I'm Siri. Choose the voice you'd like me to but use. But you don't get voice one, two, three, and four with uh, with Australian. Only with American. Hi, I'm Siri. Choose the voice you'd like me to use. So I kind of like voice three. Hi, I'm Siri. Choose the voice you'd like me to use. Kind of jaunty, isn't he? It's kind of... So that's prosody. Our word of the day. That's the uh, latest thing. And it makes it... I think it makes a huge difference. Did you see the movie Her... Scarlett Johansson is the computer assistant in his ear, in Joaquin Phoenix's ear. You know, he's got this little earpiece. And it sounds like Scarlett Johansson. It is, because in the movie, Scarlett Johansson did the voiceover. But it's not too far off where Siri might sound like Scarlett Johansson. The next step was a lot harder. Because in her, these artificial intelligences were like human. They were really... She was flirting with him. She, she got him to do things. <laughs> And then it's okay to do a spoiler for a movie that's like six years old. I can do it now, right? At the end, she says, see you later. 
uh, I'm going to go join the other AIs in AI world because you guys, you humans move way too slow. <laughs> I can't. I'm bored. Wow. That was uh, that was quite the diss. Or as the kids call it. Was it what do they call it now? Subtweeting? I just don't know. By the way, the reason this I'm aware of this in my business is, and I think I mentioned this before, voiceover artists are starting to be put out of work because they're bringing in voiceover artists and saying, sign here, we're going to record your prosody, and then we won't be needing you anymore because we'll just have the computer deliver the advertisements. And I've heard some of these from a variety of companies. They're good. Actually, there's a big controversy going on right now because there's a new documentary about Anthony Bourdain. Love Anthony Bourdain, the chef. And there was some stuff he'd written but never said. They did documentarian didn't have recordings. So he used basically a real fake of the voice using Anthony Bourdain's prosody attached to a computer-generated text so that it's indistinguishable from Anthony Bourdain saying it. And they put it in the documentary with, and of course this is controversial, without telling anybody. Anthony Bourdain's uh, partner and heir says, it's not okay. They said they asked permission. They didn't ask me permission to do that. This creepy. Well, get ready because who knows? This might, I might still be in Hawaii. This might not, this might be Leo's prosody attached to some computer answering your questions. <clears throat> and honestly, if it does a good job, who cares? <laughs> except, except the voiceover artists who are no longer getting any work. This is the new, uh, this is the new Memorex ad. Is it real or is it prosody? Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. <laughs> Welcome to the Ancient Amateur Archives. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. Do you remember that magic moment? No, I'm not talking about a song. I'm referring to that particular point in time when you heard the call of the RF and realized radio was in your blood. For me, that moment came in October 1962, over 40 years ago. In October 1962, the Cold War was at its peak thanks to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The United States was closer to nuclear war than it ever had been. Like most nuclear families of the 50s and 60s, pun intended, we had a bomb shelter of sorts in the basement. One Saturday morning, my father, my brother, and I went down to check it out. Canned food, bottled water, first aid kit, blankets, and extra clothes were there. But there was no transistor radio. Worse, we realized we didn't even own a transistor radio. All we had were tube-type AC-only models. And so that cold October morning, we all jumped in Dad's 1961 Ford station wagon for the trip that would change my life. Our destination was Olson's Electronics on Main Street in Buffalo, New York. For those who don't remember Olson's, it was a discount electronics chain headquartered in Akron, Ohio. They sold radios, CBs, hi-fi receivers, tube testers, and other electronic equipment under the Olson name. In addition, they appear to deal in discontinued, surplus, and overstocked radios under a variety of off-brand names. They issued a catalog several times a year. Unlike Heathkit, Allied, or Lafayette, whose catalogs were glossy, full-color productions, the Olson catalog was printed tabloid style on cheap newsprint with black and white illustrations. Since they carried dozens of off-brand equipment, the catalog descriptions were often generic. A typical ad might say, six transistor pocket radio, $5.95. Style and color may vary. The Olson catalog also featured a treasure chest. 
Hidden within the product descriptions were the names of several customers. If you spotted your name, you got $5. We walked into that dingy, cluttered store, and I was immediately hit with the smell. You know what I'm talking about. The combined odors of new radios, old musty radios, heated filaments, and melting solder. Then, my eyes beheld the exquisite sight of radios of every type in every square inch of the store. My ears caught the sounds of shortwave broadcasts, CB transmissions, and crisp, clear stereophonic music. My hands thrilled to the touch of Bakelite knobs, push-to-talk microphones, and telegraph keys. Deep within my body, I felt the emergence of longings and desires that I knew were inappropriate for a ten-year-old boy. I was hooked. Anyway, my father also caught the fever because he went on a spending spree. He bought an all-transistor four-band radio, AM, Marine Band, and two shortwave bands. Dad bought us each a pocket radio. Mine was a Jade 10 transistor, and my younger brother got an Essex 6 transistor unit. And then we turned our attention to the CB radios. Dad bought three Olsen one-channel 100 milliwatt walkie-talkies and an Olsen audio-visual spotter. This was a 5-watt 12-channel CB rig 22-channel tunable receive, and built-in AC-DC power supply. CB crystals, a back of set CB antenna, and batteries completed our purchase. The cost? Over $300. That's about $1,200 today, adjusted for inflation. The next day, my father's friend, an avid CBer, came over to check out the radios. He brought a collection of popular electronics magazines from 1959 to 1962, an ARRL license manual, and the ARRL book, Understanding Amateur Radio. He installed the CB in my room, much to my delight, and had a few QSOs with my brother and I as we walked around the neighborhood. Then, my father solemnly removed the microphone and hit it, saying that we couldn't transmit until he received his CB license. It took me only two days to find the microphone and hide it in my room. He never noticed it was gone. The next few weeks were a blur as I explored every kilocycle from the AM band right up to the CB channels. Buffalo was on the shores of Lake Erie, and I heard plenty of marine traffic, which at that time was in the AM mode on the 2 to 3 megacycle band. 75 and 40 meters gave me plenty of AM QSOs. I logged over 20 countries on shortwave and a dozen states on the AM band. The 100 milliwatt Olsen walkie-talkies had a city range of about six blocks, and on the rare occasions when I plugged in the mic in the Olsen, its five watts gave me over three miles, even with the indoor antenna. When I wasn't on one of the radios, I was reading and rereading the popular electronics magazines, devouring the columns on shortwave listening, CB and ham radio, and of course, drooling over the ads. That Christmas, Santa gave me two surprises from Olson, a tape recorder and an AM broadcast kit. Dad and I assembled the kit. I strung up 50 foot of wire to the garage, plugged in the crystal microphone, and got on the air. The AM broadcaster had a range of about four blocks with very good audio. I was complete. Over the next few years, I saved every penny that I received at Christmas, on my birthday, and from my allowance. I tagged along every time my mother took the bus downtown, and I begged her to walk the three blocks to the Olsen store. As time went on, I acquired other Olsen products, a 2-watt, 3-channel CB walkie-talkie, VHF receivers for the low, high, and aircraft bands, as well as 6 and 2 meter, a code practice oscillator, bigger and better shortwave radios, and audio and FM equipment. By 1969, however, things started to change. I now had my novice license, WN2MAM, and Heathkit, Lafayette, and AES catalogs grabbed my attention. A Radio Shack store opened up just three blocks from my house. By 1971, I had a general class license, a driver's license, and access to a car. I gradually sold off my Olsen equipment and replaced them with state-of-the-art radios purchased at the suburban Lafayette, Radio Shack, and Heathkit stores. The Olsen catalogs were tossed unread into the garbage. Eventually, they stopped coming. I didn't even miss him. 
1977, I moved from Buffalo to Albany, New York. There was no Olson store there. Sometime during this period, Olson went out of business. I didn't even notice. Last year, on a visit to Buffalo, I drove down the block where the Olson store once stood. The street was empty. The stores abandoned and boarded up. Later, I got on eBay and did a search on Olson Electronics. Nothing came up. Compare that to the hundreds of items you will find when you search under Lafayette or Heathkit. I went to the Akron, Ohio website and searched for Olson. Again, nothing. I emailed Rex, a discount electronics chain also headquartered in Ohio, and asked them if they were the corporate descendants of Olson. They told me no. Like an unwanted lover, Olson is gone and apparently forgotten. To quote an old song, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Your time is up. Go in peace. But return again for our next installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. Time now for the AMSAT report. Here's a quick primer to get you started on working the satellites. First, you have to be able to hear the satellite. Never transmit unless you can hear the satellite. The satellite info tab on amsat.org can give you pass predictions. Enter your location and find out when the satellites will be in view for you. The easiest satellite to start with is SO50. SO 50's downlink is 145.9 megahertz FM. What you'll want to do if you're using an HT is to store four or five memory locations with the smallest step your radio will do above and below that frequency. This lets you manually adjust for Doppler shift as the satellite approaches and recedes. A typical WIP antenna will work okay to hear the satellite You'll want a bit more metal in the air for reliable satellite work, though. Open the squelch, start listening for SO50 below 145,900, maybe 145,890 or 895, depending on the steps you programmed. As the satellite approaches, tune to the next stored frequency. You may have to go back and forth to find the sweet spot. As it gets fuzzy, tune to the next stored higher frequency. Flip your antenna from horizontal to vertical as the satellite is also spinning and sometimes one position works better than the other. That should get you started listening for SO50. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. It's time for this week's propagation forecast report courtesy of Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle. He reports that solar activity slowed this week with the average daily sunspot number declining from 48.9 last week to 33.9 this week. Wednesday, July 28th, saw no sunspots at all. The average daily solar flux went from 81.3 to 83, and geomagnetic indicators held steady with average daily planetary A and dice at 6.4 both last week and this week. The average daily middle latitude A and dice went from 6.4 last week to 6.3 this week. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux is 76 on July 31st, 74 on August 1st, 72 on August 2nd to the 4th, 74 on August 5th to the 6th, and 75 on August 7th to the 12th, 78, 80, 82, and 85 on August 13th through the 16th. Looking now at the predicted planetary A and dice, it will be 12 and 8 on July 30th and August 1st, 5 on August 2nd through the 9th, 12 and 10 on August 10th and 11th, 5 on August 12th all the way through the 15th, and 10 and 8 on August 16th and 17th, and 5 on August 28th through the 23rd. Friday and Saturday, August 6th and 7th, Russian cosmonauts on board the International Space Station will transmit slow-scan television images from the station on 145.800 MHz FM. They will use SSTV mode PD-120. 
The transmissions are part of the Moscow Aviation Institute's SSTV experiment MAI-75 and will be sent via RS-0ISS, the ham station in the Russian Zverda service module using a Kenwood TM-710 transceiver. The announced schedule is August 6, 1050 to 1910 UTC, August 7, 0950 to 1555 UTC. Dates and times are subject to change. For stations in the ISS footprint, the RS-0 ISS signal should be easy to copy on a handheld transceiver and a quarter wave whip. Use 25 kilohertz channel spacing if available. Free ISS software is available to download. Past predictions are available from AMSAT. Representative images from prior ISS slow scan TV events are available in the ARISS slow scan television gallery. A Michigan club is considering establishing a common email address for members lacking internet access. The Big Rapids Area Amateur Radio Club in Michigan is hoping to establish a common email address so that members lacking a valid email address may receive messages. The impetus for this was the recent FCC requirement that all licensees have an email address on file. One of our members is in a nursing home and we are her family, said the club's secretary, Bruce Warner, WB8TVD. One of our board members suggested club-sponsored personal email, which is forwarded similar to what is offered by the ARRL. Werner said the club is planning to work out something to accommodate members who have no or limited internet access. As ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator Manager Maria Soma, AB1FM notes, the FCC simply requires a valid and current email address where the licensee can receive electronic correspondence. She told Warner the good news is that it doesn't matter whose email address is used, as long as the FCC can reach the licensee. The box would be periodically checked by a club officer who would contact the member personally. Tom Reed, Mike Juan Echo Yankee Papa, a prominent Summits on the Air activator from Macclesfield in Cheshire, is suddenly experiencing a significant change to his portable operating habits. Tom is the world's most experienced SOTA activator, who has accumulated 3,551 summit activations over 19 years. And now he's commenced work as a professional musician on board Saga's brand new cruise ship, the Spirit of Adventure. Tom has taken with him his trusty FT817 and an Alex Loop antenna, and has secured the enthusiastic permission of the master of the vessel, Captain Kim Tanner. Tom will operate from his cabin balcony, but Captain Tanner has urged him to also operate from the public decks, believing that the activity will be something that will be of great interest to the guests on board. Tom's SOTA activities will now obviously be restricted to chasing rather than activating, but look out for him using Mikewan Echo Yankee Papa Stroke Maritime Mobile, possibly with the addition of some CEPT prefixes from this brand new luxury boutique cruise ship. The itineraries include voyages around Britain and Ireland, the Baltic, Mediterranean, Adriatic and the Canaries. Tom will be active from the Spirit of Adventure until mid-November 2021 on 40 metres to 10 metres using CW, single sideband and FT4 or FT8. And there may be some local 2 metre FM as well. World Radio Communications Conference 2 preparatory work for Agenda Item 9.1b continued on July 5th through the 13th in ITUR Working Party 4C with a focus on coexistence between the 23-centimeter amateur allocation on 1240 to 1300 megahertz and satellite navigation systems. International Amateur Radio Union member representatives from Australia, Brazil, Canada, Germany, Japan, Norway, the UK, and the US participated in the meeting and delivered additional information on amateur activities in this key microwave band. This agenda item is relevant to ITU Region 1, which is Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Northern Asia, where one channel of the Galileo GPS system in the radio navigation satellite services received interference from amateur radio. Preliminary studies from France were based on the ongoing European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications Administration's effort to provide initial estimates of separation distances required between Galileo receivers and a sample of amateur emissions. 
the European Commission Galileo team provided a set of observations pertaining to a radio navigation satellite service interference event in northern Italy. The IARU is working to ensure the amateur services are realistically represented in the studies as they move forward, said Barry Lewis, G4SJH of the IARU. It remains vital that national amateur communities present their views on the importance of this band to their national regulators in a consolidated and consistent manner. The work will continue throughout the year and beyond in both ITUR and in the regional telecommunications organizations, and the IARU is committed to ensure every group hears the amateur position on this important microwave band. More information is on the International Amateur Radio Union webpage. Foundations of Amateur Radio The essential purpose of an amateur radio contest is to get on air and make noise. Each contest has a set of rules on how they intend to achieve this. An integral part of the rules is the idea that you establish a contact, a QSO, with another station and exchange some predefined information. Likely the call sign, a signal report and often something else. A serial number, the age of the operator, a maiden head locator or the CQ or ITU zone. I'll race past the discussion around sending 5 and 9 as a standard signal report and move right along. To validate your activity, you record this information in a log, and after the contest has concluded, you share your log with the contest organiser, who collates and processes the submitted logs to determine a winner. As a participant, you look for your call sign on the results page, and if you're lucky, you get some form of trophy, a certificate, a plaque, or more often than not, a PDF. An amateur radio contest is not a particularly high-stakes competition. Recently, I asked a group of contesters a question. How do you learn why a QSO was excluded from your score? I asked because one of the eight contacts I managed during a recent contest was disallowed, leaving me with an unexplained discrepancy between my log and the results. I will note that this entry didn't affect my ranking. I won my category mainly because I was the only entrant. Ha! Depending on whom you ask, this is either a simple or a complex question. The simple explanation states that if the contact isn't in the log of both stations, it's not a valid contact. This interpretation was extremely popular in the group I asked. It was not the only answer I received. When I spoke with individual contesters, they came up with different answers to my original question. For example, if I log everything right, if I'm using a serial number, the number increments each time and my log shows that, then my log entry should be valid even if the other station didn't log it correctly. Note that I said log, not copy, as in they repeated back what I gave them, but logged it incorrectly. I also wondered what would happen if I was using a club station call sign and accidentally called CQ with my own call sign, and a station logged that call sign instead of the club station. Should they be penalized because they logged what was actually exchanged? There's more. For example, what happens if the times are not identical? Based on the simple explanation, this would not be a valid contact, so you would not get recognition for this exchange, and in some contests an invalid contact will produce a penalty to both stations. Another variation to the simple answer occurs if the contest organiser doesn't receive a log for every station, and as a result some contests set a maximum number of contacts for stations without logs. All this came within the context of attempting to discover how log validation happens who decides what's valid, and what rules are used. During my group conversation, two contest managers shared how they scored their particular contests, and showed that they attempted to award the benefit of doubt to each station. One decided after the discussion to change their interpretation to the simple explanation I've already looked at. I wanted to know if there was any standard, and other than pointing vaguely in the direction of a few large contests, I didn't actually manage to find any definitive discussion on how this works. If it's universal, which I suspect it isn't, and if it changes over time, which I know it does. The largest annual contest is the CQ Worldwide. In a 2012 blog post, the contest committee discusses the time window of a contact and explains that they allow a 15-minute window, so as long as both contacts agree within 15 minutes, the QSO is allowed. 
That post also pointed out that if the time for one station was out by 45 minutes, none of their contacts would be allowed, and anyone who made contact with that station would by implication get a penalty. Clearly there are variations on how this is handled. I asked if there is validation software for logs that checks this, and if that software is open source so others can look at how decisions are made and see how these evolve over time. Is there an arbitration that goes beyond the standard phrasing in most contests? The decision of the contest committee is final. I was told that this wasn't necessary and I should focus on more practice. I beg to differ. I've been contesting for a decade now. I have plenty of winning certificates on my wall. I'd like to improve my skill, and I'd like to learn why and how my contacts are disallowed, and I'd like others to be able to do the same. Log checking software is written by humans who interpret the rules and write software to conform to those rules. In order to see what rules are in place and to validate that, the source of that software must, in my opinion, be open and transparent. As a community, we sit at the boundary between professional communications and a hobby, and we often use the idea and concepts of a contest to argue that this is the best way to hone skills and to make you a better operator in case of an emergency. But if you cannot actually learn from your mistakes, if there is no discussion on how decisions are made, if there's nothing beyond simple answers, then are we really striving for improvement or just set in our ways? For the record, I think that if a contest log is off by 45 minutes throughout the entire log, software should pick that up, award the contacts and point out the mistake to the person who didn't set their clock correctly, especially since time is not exchanged during any contest I know. I also think that if a station logged what was actually said, there is room for that to be considered a valid exchange, but then I've only been an amateur contester for a decade, so I have plenty to learn. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. In a recent Voice of America Zimbabwe video, Raisa R1BIG explained that due to antenna limitations at her apartment, she operates portable amateur radio most of the time. Uh, and it is not possible to install antenna here. Uh, but I uh, must tell you that I like nature and I like so simple uh, equipment, uh, so simple antenna, and you get very uh, long distance uh, station. Tom Witherspoon, K4SWL, also likes to get out on the mountains of North Carolina with his very portable station, an Elecraft KX2 on a clipboard. My Morse code paddle is attached to it, and I have a little logging sheet, and my entire station, my entire amateur radio station I'm using to communicate thousands of miles is right there on my lap on a clipboard. As Raisa and Tom demonstrate, it's not hard to get on the air away from the shock with simple antennas and equipment, and maybe get in some exercise in the process. On July the 16th, the Japanese National Amateur Radio Society, JARL, started up the special commemorative call sign, Juliet Alpha 1, Tango Oscar, Kilo Yankee Oscar, in Nishi Tokyo City, Tokyo, to commemorate the 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games being held from July the 23rd. After the opening ceremony of JA1 Tokyo, a lead operator was assigned to each band for active operation. In the evening, a member of Japan's House of Representatives, Hirohiko Izumida, attended the venue and operated the station in the 7 MHz band. Hirohiko is an amateur radio operator, 7 Kilo 1, Kilo Juliet Kilo, and a member of the JARL. The station will be active until September the 5th. And for more information, visit tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Japan. Ofcom has published proposals to change the way it licenses certain satellite systems. A number of new satellite broadband networks are currently being developed, which use non-geostationary satellite orbit systems, that's NGSO systems, to connect people to the Internet, particularly those in hard-to-reach areas. NGSO systems are more sophisticated than earlier satellite broadband networks. Rather than ground equipment pointing at a single satellite to connect people, NGSO networks can involve thousands of satellites orbiting the Earth, which ground-based satellite dishes need to track as they move across the sky. 
While this can potentially bring faster speeds to customers, it can be more complex for different NGSO satellite operators to agree how to operate their networks without them interfering with each other. So, to help support competition in this market and protect the quality of the service customers receive, Ofcom are proposing changes to the licensing process for NGSO systems. This includes new checks on potential interference between networks and publishing license applications Ofcom receives so other interested parties have an opportunity to raise any interference or competition concerns. The changes would also require different networks to cooperate with each other on technical matters to avoid risk of disruption to their services under the conditions of the license. Ofcom recognizes the importance of these new services to the wider space sector and will be publishing a space sector spectrum strategy this autumn. Ofcom welcomes responses to these licensing proposals. The deadline is the 20th of September 2021. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Over the months, I've received a few requests for this topics. So in answer to these requests, here's Greg's short topics list, volume number one. First, RF exposure. Depending upon whom you ask, the jury is still out on this topic. There are laws which govern exposure in the workplace which may be located on a tower if you're being paid to climb. Certain lockout devices are required by local, state, or federal law to prevent antennas on a tower from being used while you are climbing. If you're climbing on your own tower or someone else's, there may be antennas on the air while you are climbing near them. You have to make up your own mind regarding what you are willing to risk. If you want my opinion, you should avoid exposure to strong RF fields. I will not climb a commercial tower while any broadcast transmitters are active on them. Paging transmitters can pack a healthy wallop, but often do not run all the time. Since the problem with RF is twofold, both exposure and contact, you should attempt to get all active systems on the tower shut down before climbing. If the tower is very tall and you will be separated vertically by a comfortable distance and not climb past any active antennas, you may choose to leave the stuff on at, say, 400 feet if you're only climbing to 200 feet. In my opinion, this rule does not apply to broadcast transmitters. Contact with a metal antenna transmitting a signal as low as 2 watts can produce an RF burn. I know I've gotten them myself, and much to my surprise. If you have any other health problems, RF exposure may be of special interest to you. One example would be a climber with a cardiac pacemaker. Secondly, Sudden weather changes can be an unpleasant event for any climber. This has happened to me a few times, usually in the form of sudden wind changes. In some areas of the world, the weather can change suddenly due to limited visibility and can creep up without any visible signs. In the case of lightning, the answer is simple. Get down and get away from the tower as quickly as possible. Depending upon how you were dressed, rain may or may not present a big safety problem. For me personally, rain is more a matter of comfort but if your gear is not suitable for the rain, when it shows its ugly face, it's time for you to exit the tower site. Rain does make surfaces slick, but the proper gear can minimize the problem. You do not want to let your clothing become drenched while installing a 40-pound antenna at 250 feet, so keep an eye on the forecast before starting any antenna job and bring rain gear if needed. I'd rather climb in the snow than rain. If your clothes become drenched while climbing in the rain, this can add lots of additional weight which can also jeopardize your safety. Wind is another story. On a guide tower, wind is not as big a problem as on a self-supporting tower. When a freestanding tower sways in the wind, it causes a weird sensation in the climber's head, similar to the feeling of being suddenly lightheaded. Since you are away from all visual cues of movement on a tower, the, the sway is only felt in the climber's inner ear and in the neck. If you are on a commercial tower, wind may not present an immediate safety problem. This is not the case on a light-duty TV antenna tower in someone's yard. In this case, I always abandon the job and wait for the wind to stop, like maybe that night. On a commercial tower, if you're not moving a long antenna, the wind is more of a hassle than enemy. If you're moving antennas in the wind on a large tower, you'll have to decide for yourself if you can safely handle the antenna. The only way I know to safely exit a tower is to have first installed a rope and anchor and rappel off of it. 
If you feel you may need a fast way to get down off a tower, installing a rappelling rope as the first task after you get to the work site at the tower. Rappelling is considered to be one of the most dangerous forms of rope work since you are totally dependent upon the rope. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The IARU Region 1 Youth Working Group has issued an update on amateur radio youth activities planned for 2021. Despite the COVID-19 situation having improved over the past few months on a global scale, the development and dynamics of the pandemic remain unpredictable. The same unpredictability goes for regulations regarding the pandemic, which in many cases severely limit the ability to hold in-person events with international participants. To deal with the pandemic situation, Yota announced an event cancellation policy earlier this year, which introduced a four-month deadline for a go-no-go -go decision for in-person events. This four-month deadline has, however, turned out to be slightly too far into the future for a reliable prediction. Accordingly, the IARU Region 1 Youth Working Group, in collaboration with the Executive Committee, has made the following arrangement. Youth events scheduled within 2021 will remain in the calendar for the time being. The IARU Region 1 Youth Working Group will review the forecast evolution of the pandemic in good time prior to each event and make an announcement about whether it will take place. Generally, this will be three months in advance of the scheduled date. Those planning to attend should thus have sufficient time to make the necessary bookings and travel arrangements. IARU Region 1's intent is to ensure that any events which take place do so in an environment which respects national requirements for pandemic control and which does not place at risk the health and well-being of those participating. WL2XUP is an FCC Part 5 experimental station operated by Lynn Holcomb, NI4Y in Georgia. He's licensed to operate with up to 400 watts effective radiated power between 40.660 to 40.700 megahertz. John Desmond, EI7GL, reports that as of mid-July, WL2UXP was intermittently transmitting on weak signal propagation reporter on 40.662 megahertz for two minutes out of every 10, with an output power of 20 watts ERP into an omnidirectional antenna. For FTA check-ins and tests, an ERP of 100 watts may be used. The band is affected by several propagation modes, including tropospheric ducting, sporadic E, trans-equatorial propagation, and F2 propagation. As Desmond notes, the 40 MHz band will open a lot earlier than 50 MHz and could be a useful resource for stations monitoring the transatlantic path. A 2019 petition for rulemaking in the RM docket number 11843 Ask the FCC to create a new 8-meter amateur radio allocation on a secondary basis. The petition suggests that the new band could be centered on the industrial scientific medical segment somewhere between 40.51 and 40.70 MHz. The spectrum between 40 and 41 MHz is currently allocated to the federal government and as such within the purview of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. ARRL member Michelle Bradley, KU3N of Maryland, filed a petition on behalf of the REC Networks, which she founded and described in the petition as a leading advocate for a citizen's access to spectrum, including amateur radio spectrum. A judge in the Massachusetts Land Court has ruled that the Zoning Board of Appeals in the city of Framingham erred in revoking a building permit for an 80-foot ham radio tower as an accessory use. The building commissioner in Framingham had granted ARRL member Mikhail Filipov, KD1MF, a building permit for the tower, and Filipov had begun pouring concrete for the tower footings. Neighbors complained, however, and the Zoning Board of Appeals revoked the permit, citing the setback requirements of the city's wireless communications facilities special permit bylaw. Land Court Judge Howard Spiker reversed the Zoning Board of Appeals decision and ordered the Town Building Commissioner to reinstate the permit. The City of Framingham has provided, for the benefit of amateur radio operators, 
exemptions from its zoning requirements from the construction of radio antenna towers for amateur radio operators, the court noted. This case was not settled on the basis of PRB-1 considerations, but strictly on which setback requirements should apply. PRB-1 requires local governments to reasonably accommodate amateur radio installations. The Zoning Board of Appeals had argued that Filipov's project plans failed to meet setback zoning requirements, but the land court determined that the board could not enforce this because of an exception that exempts structures, including amateur radio towers, from these requirements as long as a building permit is issued. The court ruled the Zoning Board of Appeals erred in overturning the decision of the building commissioner to issue a building permit for the erection of the proposed radio antenna tower. The Wireless Communications Facility Bylaws definition of a tower is very broad, and the HAMS tower appeared to fit within that definition, causing the Zoning Board of Appeals to require the WCF setback of structure height plus 20 feet. The next sentence in the same WCF paragraph, however, requires that any such facility shall be a minimum of 300 feet from a residential zoning district or residential use. The Zoning Board of Appeals had suggested that Filipov reapply for a more central location on his lot. The court recognized, however, that amateur radio towers, under the Framingham bylaw, are exempt from special permit requirements. By its decision, the board has taken the position that it may pick and choose which of those requirements will remain applicable to uses that are, by the explicit terms of the bylaw, exempt from the special permit requirement the land court ruled. No reasonable reading of the bylaw permits this unfettered exercise of discretion. The special event call sign Hotel Sierra 18 India Alpha Romeo Uniform is now active on all bands to promote the online IARU Region 3 conference which is soon to take place. The Radio Society of Thailand said that the special call sign, issued by Thailand's National Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission, is to promote the 18th IARU Region 3 conference that they will be hosting online. The call sign will remain active until September 30, 2021. The conference, which will take place on September the 20th to the 23rd, will be the first virtual IARU conference, and RAST will host the event online for the safety and convenience of all participants. The virtual IARU Region 3 conference will have a wide range of remote speakers, and will be conducted under the leadership of RAST President Dr. Jack Hanton Com, Hotel Sierra One, Foxtrot Victor Lima, who is also an IARU Region 3 director. For stations that make contacts with HS18 IARU, a QSL card can be applied for by sending a stamped addressed envelope to the Radio Amateur Society of Thailand under the patronage of His Majesty the King, Hotel Sierra 18 IARU, PO Box 2008, Bangkok, Thailand 10501. Respondents living overseas should include funds to cover return postage for a direct QSL card. The cards will be posted out starting in November 2021. Missouri First Capital State Historic Site in St. Charles will host an amateur radio event on August 10th in association with this year's celebration of the Missouri State Bicentennial. The original Capitol building on the west bank of the Missouri River served the state's capital from 1821 to 1826. The site is part of St. Charles Historic District in the city's riverfront neighborhood and is adjacent to Frontier Park, from which Lewis and Clark launched their Corps of Discovery expedition in August of 1803. Members of the St. Charles Amateur Radio Club will use a special event call sign K0 Bravo at the site of the First Capitol on August 10th. The First Capitol site also qualifies for a Parks on the Air program with the identifier K-3349. Additional Parks on the Air style activations from both the First Capital site and from the adjacent Frontier Park are listed as possible on other dates, depending on weather and operator availability. K0 Bravo will be active on single sideband, CW, FT8 on 80 through 6 meters as well as 2 meters FM. K0 Bravo will be active from the annual St. Charles Amateur Radio Club Hamfest and Flea Market in O'Fallon on August 8th 
and from the club member stations at various times August 7th through the 15th. An operating schedule will be posted on the SCARC Facebook page. Contacts will be uploaded to Logbook of the World. A paper QSL and downloadable PDF certificate will be available. Members of the Mid-MO Amateur Radio Club will use the special event call sign Whiskey Zero Mike August 7th through 10th and other Missouri clubs may also be active to commemorate the Bicentennial. The Missouri QSL party on July 13th through August 1st will also feature special call signs and the activation of rare counties. Typically, the event is held in April. Here is this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, which are members only benefit. To register, check on upcoming webinars and to view previously recorded sessions, visit the Learning Network webinar page. Introduction to DMR and Digital Voice, hosted by Tim Deegan, KJ8U, will be held on Thursday, September 9th, 2021 at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, that's 1930 UTC. An introductory overview of digital voice technologies for ham radio. This presentation will focus on DMR with notes on System Fusion, D-Star, and more. Included will be a description of digital voice architecture and components, and the interesting opportunities and challenges that Digital Voice presents. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change, so be sure to check the webpage for the latest updates. And finally this week, if chasing special event stations is your cup of tea, you might want to check out what's going to be brewing between August 1st through to August 8th. Hams around the country will be calling QRZ on all bands using all modes to celebrate the world's largest teapot. You heard that right. The celebrated teapot stands 14 feet high and 14 feet in diameter in northern West Virginia near the border with Ohio and the special event coincides with the annual Teapot Festival in Chester, West Virginia, on August 7th. The local club organizing the event, the Hancock Auxiliary Communications Team, will be using the call sign W8T and will be operating from the site of the Teapot itself. There will also be a bonus station, WV8HAT. This is the fifth year for the special event, but according to one of the organizers, Justin Shaw, W8LPN, this is the first year there will be 10 stations activating using W number T call signs from all call areas around the country. Contact with all 10 gets chasers a clean sweep, known as a full cup. Hams contacting all stations plus the bonus station are eligible for a full pot. Information about certificates is available on the QRZ page for W8T. Even if tea isn't your bag, you may find the history of this beloved symbol compelling. Its humble origins date to the years before World War II, when it began life as a wooden barrel used in a root beer advertising campaign. A handle and a spout were later added, and, reborn as a teapot, it enjoyed subsequent roles as a concession stand, a souvenir shop, and a pottery with a gift shop. After it was refurbished, it was rededicated in 1990 as a beloved symbol of local identity. It has since inspired the annual festival in August, where proud residents can share that their cups runneth over. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry This Week in Amateur Radio and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. That address, once again, is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, 
the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.